right, so I'm going to pass over to Dr. Pedro, and we have the second part for this uh, inlay and onlay lecture. Uh, so he's going to be explaining to you the diamond points that he has used and step by step how to do a prep for inlay and also for the onlay. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yes, well, last week uh, a lot of you came to me to, in, uh, in the lab and asked about the diamond points used to do this type of preparation. So I put here some type of diamond points and the most important thing is that you understand what will happen in the tooth depending on what type of diamond point you are using. <coughs> Don't uh, worry about to memorize numbers, numbers of diamond points. Because depending on the brand, the number will change and even depending on the country that you are going to work. Okay? So for now, keep in mind just these five diamond points. Okay? There are much more. But for now, let's just think about this part. So, uh, we have here the conical round edge paper with two different diameters, 1.6 and 2.5. Depending on the size of your craft, you can choose one or another, right? The diameter is in the active point, in the active tip, right? Uh, the conical round and taper, it's more long and the diameter is, will be 1.2 and 1.9. This diamond point is good. This one is good to, to work on the crucial box and the conical round and taper on the proximal box. All right? And this one that looks like a needle on the active point, this diamond point has 0.3 millimeters. It's good to connecting the surface on the prep, like for you to do smooth angles, smooth and rounded surface along the, the prep. Okay? So let's start now with the prep, step by step. And you were just going to see this type, these five words here during the uh, step by step of the preparation. Uh, all the preps <coughs> that you are going to do, actually all the preps that we do, we want to have this enamel margin here. This is the perfect, uh, perfect prep. We want that super gingival margin and we desire that we want, we, we can see the enamel along all the margin along all the shoulder, all right? Like this. If you have a prep like this one that we see in this picture, perfect. But to get a prep like this one, you have to work with the exact instruments, right? You have to use the manual instruments and the pro appropriate downward points, all right? Let's see the step by step do a prep like this. The first one that we're going to start is the inlay prep. Think that if, if always we are going to start from an inlay prep. If we're going to do an only or an in, or a, if we're going to do an only preparation, the first thing is an inlay prep. So it's where we're going to start, thinking on an inlay prep. The first step we are going to do the crucial box. And here, to do the occlusal blocks with the diamond points, we don't need to follow the central grooves. We can do occlusal blocks straight on the tooth, all right? And another important thing is it's sometimes, if you don't know exactly the size of the bird that you are working, you can measure this bird before you start your prep, all right? So you can measure with an angle ruler or a similar to see how long is active tip 
also the diameter of this bird, of this diamond point. I'm sorry, it's not a bird; it's a diamond point. Okay, so you you will know how deep you need to go on the enamel, and the the thickness of your prep, thinking the, the easternmost distance. All right. So uh, we start the inlay prep going through the <coughs> occlusal box. All right. We are going to to shave down this occlusal box two millimeters, two millimeters from the 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 isthmus, Okay, from the the book pro or the wall wall. And remember that this inlay prep on the surrounding walls, we don't have bevel and cable surface, cable surface approximately 90 degrees. All right? Uh, after we shake down the cruiser box, we'll have 1.5 to 2 millimeters the depth of this prep. And we desire to have a divergence of the walls between 10 to 15 degrees. Okay, everything good so far? Is that the natural <coughs> in inclination of the? The natural inclination of the active tip of the diamond point. Okay, you, you you don't need to work with the with the head of their handpiece to to achieve this inclination. The bar, the diamond point will give to you this divergence here. All right, it's clear. So after shake down the cruiser box, we go and we work on the proximal boxes. Always remember to put the matrix and the wedge to protect your adjacent two teeth. Because we have, normally we will have two, okay? On the medium and distal, all right? Always remember to put the wedge and the matrix to protect your adjacent two. And, well, we go and, um, so, I'm sorry, let me just let me go back here and explain to you. To do the, the proximal box, remember to keep the diamond point, the long axis of the diamond point parallel to the long <coughs> axis of, of the tooth. Okay? And <coughs> drop and shave down the, the proximal boxes. Alright? The ideal size of the proximal box We'll, be, we'll, we'll have the gingival wall with a minimum at one point and one millimeter, all right? And we must have convergence between the axial wall, okay? And this we are going to achieve through the inclination of the active tip of the diamond point two, all right? See here, the axis, axial wall, Six to eight degrees is the converse, convergence of the axial wall. <coughs> All right, thank you. So another important thing is the clearance between the tooth that we are doing the preparation and the adjacent tooth, adjacent teeth. All right. We must have at least one millimeter, all right? At least one millimeter. Why? Sorry? <coughs> no, no, we are thinking here on uh, indirect preparation. Because of two main things. The first one, the lab technician need room to do the die test and use a saw here between the adjacent tooth and the dent and the tooth that you are doing the preparation. And the other thing is that you want that your breath is scanned 
by the CAD CAM. So you must have this clearance here so you can see the margins on the pros home boxes. All right? This is clear? Okay. So after the clearance, working on the clearance, we, we are going to smooth the line angles with the needle down one point. All the line angles, the axial pupil angle, we must make it smooth and round. All right? To avoid stress concentration. So here we have before and after we work on <coughs> the margins of the proximal box and on the pull, axial pupil angles. Remember, the clearance, at least one millimeter, and the axial pupil angle is smooth and round. Okay? But the prep is not finished yet. After that, we must <coughs> work with the manual instruments. And not only in class two, we were going to work with gingival marginal trimmer. Also here, we must use the gingival marginal trimmer to remove the unsupported enamel. It's with these steps that we are going to achieve a prep like we saw in the beginning of the lecture with all the margin with that beautiful enamel, right? So remember that to use the correct mar gingival marginal trimmer, depending on which side of the tooth you are working, if it's mesial or distal. And beginning, begin to work with gingival marginal trimmer from the center all right, always begin from the center towards the, the buccal or lingual, depending on the direction you are working. So, so after that, we are going to remove all the walls on the breath. The surrounding walls, the pupil, the actual, the gingival, all the walls, and we do that with a fine or extra fine down one point. The same size, the same down one point that you use it to do the prep. You, you can have one with fine or extra fine and work with this down one point <coughs> before you finish to smooth all the walls. So here we have the inlay characteristics with the smooth walls that we're going to achieve to this fine or extra fine diamond point, super gingival margins, rounded internal angles, no bevel on cable surface. Remember this to fit better the restoration, pupil wall is slightly concave. Right? It's likely concave. Actual walls with occlusal convergence about 6 to 8 degrees. And surrounding occlusal walls divergence of 10 to 15 degrees. All this convergence and divergence we are going to achieve through the inclination of the active tip to down one point. And I put here again because last lecture it was with the same color is the way that we want that we want to finish the angles always rounded and smooth because this type of sharp angle will have a stress concentration here and depending on the thickness of our cusp this could fracture <coughs> okay 
And our final prep, we have the isthmus distance <coughs> at least two millimeters, and the depth of central tube two millimeters to, from the depth to the pupa wall, and all the angles rounded. All right? It's clear. Okay. And now we are going to start the only prep. We are going to review this first step of inlay. It's the same thing in the beginning. It's the same thing, but now it's in a, a molar. Then we are going to see how to do the cusps coverage of an inlay prep. So the, the thing is to understand, it's from an inlay, we are going to expand this prep to an inlay prep working on the cusps. Uh, so like that, okay? We are going to expand the inlay prep to an inlay prep, covering the cusps. Uh, when we do the inlay preparation, it's we we need to understand which are the function, functional and non-functional cusps. Let's just rem memorize for now that on upper jaw, our bite cusp is the lingual, is the, the lingual, all right? And on the lower, our bite cusp is the facial, okay? And the others will be the non-functional cusp, all right? So we are going to start our prep the same way, keeping the long axis of the diamond point parallel to the long axis of the tooth, and do a straight occlusal box. Don't follow the grooves. Don't need to follow the grooves here. It's not a conservative prep. Again, the minimal isthmus distance will be two millimeters. We will achieve this for the active tip of the diamond point. And we were going to do the proximal boxes, the same way that we did on the inlay prep. After shaving down the proximal box, again, using the needle diamond point to, to smooth the line and angles between the actual and Pupa wall. And remember to have at least one millimeter of clearance between the tooth that we're doing the preparation and the adjacent tooth. So here, if we are going to work on the bite cusp, we must have at least two millimeters of reduction of the cusp. If we are going to work on a non-bite cusp, this reduction could vary from 1.5 to 2 millimeters. If you have enough room with 1.5, that's okay. A non-bite cusp, all right? And then we are going to shoulder preparation, okay? So so the first step now, after doing the inlay prep, to start the inlay, we are going to do this orientation that groups on the internal slope of the cusps. And you can do three or four of the orientation that groups. And then we connect it, go on. All this orientation that that groups, okay? making a flat surface on the internal as well of the cusp. So after that we're going to do the same thing on the external as well. Do three to four orientation depth groups and then you connect all these depth groups shaving down the cusp. And we are going to have two flat surfaces, an internal slope and an external slope. 
after having this true flat surface, we are going to smooth and round the surface. All right? The connecting surface, connecting these two surfaces. So, <clears throat> after connecting these two surfaces, we go to the shoulder preparation. And this shoulder preparation will have 1.5 to 2 millimeters from the cusp, okay, from the top of the cusp after you shave it down. And the thickness of the shoulder will have between 1 and 1.2. All right? And with the same way, we are going to use the gingival marginal trimmer on the margins to remove unsupported enamel. We use on the proximal box, and we are going to use along the shoulder, too. Okay? Again, finishing the prep always with an extra fine or fine down one point. And do is move and round the angles along all your tracks to avoid stress concentration. This is, I keep repeating this, but this is very important for ceramic restorations. If you don't do that, your restoration will fail. And I mean, the preparation characteristics are very similar from the inlay prep. Smooth walls, super gingival margins, rounded internal angles, no bevel on the cable surface. Pulpa wall again is slightly concave, so it fit better your respiration. And pulpa box that 1.5 2 millimeters. So, Axel's wall converges towards the cruzo. Same way on the inlay. Surrounding walls, 10 to 15 degrees of divergence. At least one millimeter between proximal contact. And remember this, bite cusps, two millimeters. Okay? And non bite cusps, you can go from 1.5 to 2 millimeters. And the shoulder, 1 to 1.2 millimeters. Here we have some cardigan rules, and again, the five commandments <coughs> that you must memorize for the final exam, okay? So, when we're going to work in cardigan, again, the decimals 2.2 millimeters. Here, the buccal limbo distance on your proximal box, 3.5 millimeters. This will give you enough clearance to work on the restoration outside the mouth. We can see here the, the proximal box, 10 degrees between the surrounding walls, right? And the gingival margin on the proximal box with a width of 1.5. And uh, again, the buccal depth of 2.0 millimeters, all right? So let's see, do you, mem do you remember these five commandments? You memorized it? No? <laughs> Just remember to memorize this for your final exam, okay? And again, G volcares of at least one millimeter, all right? Okay, any questions? No? Is everything clear? Yeah? Yes? So the occlusal divergence is 6 to 8 degrees, but then the axial converges 6 to 8 degrees? Yeah, the, the actual walls, the, uh, okay, here. the actual walls will converge Six to eight and the occlusal ten degrees. Okay. 
we have a conver convergence between the axial and divergence between the facial and the facial and the All right? Yes. Uh, no? Not a question. Uh, so, okay. So now, Dr. Roberto will come to you and explain the correct software. I don't know if you noticed, but uh, we actually cutting plastic teeth and virgin <coughs> plastic teeth, right? With no restoration whatsoever. So this won't really happen in a real clinical situation, right? Patient in your chair, and suddenly have it just like a small, tiny occlusal decay. Guess what? This is an OLE. No, it won't happen. So normally those cases, those clinical applications for inlays, on lays, whatever, Patients are normally sitting in your chair with a tooth with a large restoration or a broken tooth that some of the patient had an accident and without breaking the cusp or something like that. Or was uh, underneath the cave on the previous restoration, things like that. Actually this morning we had two cases. Two patients came in and we had one patient with the visual lingual cusp on tooth number 19 broken uh, from a previous large restoration. And the other patient was a different situation, was an upper tooth, but also with the two lingual cusps completely uh, not supported by enamel or dent, but actually for decay. So, you know, just keep in mind that because here we are cutting plastic teeth, the same rules won't apply, won't apply in clinic. So normally in clinic, what I'm gonna find is, is a tooth compromise with a large restoration done before, or a large decay because the patient didn't brush or didn't floss properly, or the patient had an accident and they're up, you know, punching the face, whatever, and they're breaking the tooth, things like that. But still, it is so important for you to memorize every single rule that it just gave you. For instance, what is the main rule for inlays and onlays? What do you consider the top number one rule when you're prepping a tooth to receive an indirect restoration? What? Divergence, right? Why? Because if you have an undercut there first, if you're doing a regular lab case, there is no way you can take compression and send to the lab. That guy's going to call and say, Doctor, I'm sorry, there's no way I can do that restoration. Call your patient back and you know, finish that prep better. I hate that situation. When my lab guys call me, I'm furious. Like, oh, gosh. You know, like, it is kind of like embarrassing because I'm the doctor, right? And he's the lab guy. I'm not <laughs> depreciating the, the knowledge of fashion, please. But I'm in charge. I'm the boss here, right? So I'll do a perfect job in a way that the lab guy, you know, won't call me. I really respect the lab people I work with because every time they call me, I respect the opinion. So if you know what, my apologies. I'm going to fix the crap, take a new impression, send you back. Right? Way back, what is the second most important thing that you learned from these two lectures for inlays and onlays? Well, first, we talk about the divergence. What is the second or most important thing? No. I'll try harder. Converging at the wall? No. Yeah, well, when I mentioned about the first big rule of divergence, keep it also in mind that you must, let's change that name, okay? Let's uh, avoid undercuts. And then immediately think about the rule for the 6 to 8 degree divergence for the buccal lingual walls, sometimes 10 degrees, the way I'm asking here, and the convergency for the axial walls, all right? This way, if you put everything together, we are avoiding undercuts. If you, if you answer one question on my final exam like that, that's perfect, okay? If I have a question, okay, I'm not saying I have a question. But anyways, what is the second most important rule? Yeah. Nope. Enough room. Who said that? Reduction. reduction. If you don't have enough reduction, forget it. Remember, reduction, we are working with one specific rule in terms of material or properties that you're putting in the tube. It's called resistance. If you don't have enough reduction, the lab guy might say, you know what, doctor is asking that. Uh, who cares? I'm checking the articulator here. I'm going to send it back this only with one less, that's a less than one millimeter thickness for the occlusal ceramic. Do you think that's going to last? Why not? Because we are dentists. We work with dental materials and we know the material properties. 
we know the mechanical limitations on every single we're supposed to know that, okay? We're supposed to know that every single limitation on every single thing that you're using in the, in the industry. When it comes to ceramic, we have a magic number. Minimal, minimal reduction or thickness would be one millimeter. Ideal, 1.2. This is the, like a universal rule for ceramic, all right? So reduction is the second most important rule. Then you start thinking like, wow, well, wait a second. I remember Dr. Porter, he mentioned about the clearance. Why clearance is so important? Why clearance is so important? Why for scanning using a CAD machine clearance is so important? Because you need a contrast. You need to like have a, a clear, a clear margin. Like. Space, right? Otherwise, the camera will like, won't get that information, and we'll, we call it bridging teeth. So you won't have the room, the space in between teeth. There is no way you can draw the margin. What if if you take impressions and send this case to a lab? Why do you need clearance? Like, the guy, as Dr. Porto mentioned, he needs to use an you know, saw there and cut a particular tooth in order to also adjust the proximal context later on. <laughs> See how simple it is. Now, when you go to the clinical floor next year and you work with me in a Sari case, I want you to start thinking that way. I want you to come to me and say, Dr. Roberto, I have this patient here. This is a tooth number 30. Okay, and I'm doing this uh, mesial occlusal. Uh, restoration. I was checking this, and patient had this broken restoration, but now suddenly I noticed that the mesolingual cusp is compromised. I think we, have, we can do an only for this particular patient here, and based on the lectures I had with you, I'm ready to do divergence on the walls, convergency on the axial walls. I'm also ready to do the proper reduction, also create a clearance, and ready to go to use the catechic machine. That's the minimal level of knowledge I'm expecting from you in the third year. Please, make me proud. Because the last thing we want to see in a student when it comes like, to a real clinical case is say like, yeah, I'm doing an OLA, uh, yeah, I don't know what to do. But really, do you still remember the Five Commandments? Do I have to remind you the Five Commandments? No, come on. So this is this is the past, you know, like this is a clinical experience. I want you to be ready and turn that into an excitement. Okay? So if you please memorize these five commandments, the basic rules we gave here, these three basic rules when it comes to like a real clinical case, and you have to change that real regular clinical case into a CAD CAM case or to a direct procedure. I'm really I'm super happy. Okay, that's a big message from these two lectures here. I also want to thank Dr. Porter because he worked really hard for these two lectures and uh, definitely he's going to be a great professor here, hopefully in North America soon. Okay, thank you. Now, yeah, come on. We are going to the lab and the project number 11 is an only project that you don't have to drill the tooth. Because first, you don't have time. Secondly, I want you to concentrate and memorize those rules first, and also get the sense to work with the ceramic software. All right? So if you go on the e-curriculum, and I'll actually show you your online. If you go on the e-curriculum, uh, on VP of 2, we do have a number of serif exercise files here. Uh, I don't know if you guys had the curiosity to download those files and check in your computer, but guess what? Every single project that you work in my context, my discipline, you can download the file and play in a 3D on your computer screen. So if you have the serif running your computer, click here in those files. Let's say they are doing number 30, right? That's project number uh, 11. You're going to save the file. Let's hit OK. Here's the file on your computer. You can save that file on your desktop. It would be the easiest way to work with this file here. Once you have the file on your desktop, it's right here. You're going to uh, fire up your CEREC application. 
Uh, if you click here in restoration and import, select the file from the desktop, desktop and you can open the file on the computer screen. So for, <coughs> since the beginning, since project number one, project number two, three, and so on, you can now check all those preparations on your computer using the 3D. Would it be interesting for you to check you know, uh, some tools that you have interesting here on this software? For instance, you can rotate here, you can see all the walls, same thing we did in lab with you for some exercises. Uh, we can see the convergence walls, you can see the divergence, in this case here this is an only. Okay, so things like that. So play with those files and take a look in preps and if you ever had a curiosity to go back to the lab and training more preparations after you're done my discipline, do that. My suggestion for you, keep training, keep going. Download those files, put in your computer, go to the lab, your spare time during the weekends, whatever, rotate the tooth, do the prep again, over and over again. All right? Particularly, this is the project number 11. This is the tooth number 30. And we're supposed to do an MOL prep here. Same situation. Patient came here to clinic, had a mesial occlusal restoration done a long time ago. This was all composite filling. And the mesial lingual cusp ended up being fractured because. This was a large preparation. So removing the previous filling here, uh, we decide to do the only prep. Let's follow the rules that you just learned from uh, Dr. Porto's lecture. First of all, do we have enough uh, divergence here on the walls? I'll just cut this two and a half here, I'm sorry. Okay, do we have divergence there? Do you think it's closer to 68 degrees? Yeah, it's pretty close, right? More laser point here. Yeah. Do you see the divergence right here? Do you see the internal line angles that are rounded? Right over here? Right over here? Right over there? Is it a prep? Why do you want to avoid sharp internal line angles? Yeah, Actual, right? Stress, concentration in one spot, you don't want that. Round, that everything is round and smooth. Like toboggan, same thing. Everything is just like a toboggan. Smooth and rounded, okay? Do you see the axle wall here? Do you see some convergency on the axle wall? Right there? Look over here. Around it. Okay? Now, do we have enough reduction? I think so, right? This is pretty decent. So, that's the thing I want you guys to play uh, for the project number 11. You're going to use it in your computer. You're going to play with this file here. Now, we have to do a few steps to complete the final restoration. And I'm just going to give you quickly here all these steps. That's not super hard. If you have questions later on, you can ask me, or I can also go online and watch one of, one of my videos. And I'm, I'm explaining step by step what to do. Every time you open a Cerex software, the machine is going to tell you right here in the bottom on your left side. You see here? Train preparation. By the way, if you press and hold the left button, you know what is the left button, right? I'm just asking because I had a cervical rotation exercise last year and asked to do Press and hold the left button. What the heck is that? <laughs> left button on your mouse. I don't use a mouse. I don't know what is a mouse. <coughs> so I realized that this is the trackpad generation. You guys are a trackpad generation or a third screen generation. Unfortunately, this piece of crap is not third screen. <laughs> okay, including the software, won't work with the third screen device. All right, <coughs> train the prep. So if you press and hold the left button and move your trackpad, you can move three dimensionally your preparation. If you press and hold the right button, you can move over the screen. 
the way I'm doing right here. All right? Let me just go back one step here. <coughs> so what you're going to do is just follow the software's uh, rules here. So train the prep. You're going to put my cursor here right <coughs> between the teeth. Double left click. You see that blue line following my cursor? Now I have a green line on the bottom and a blue line on the top. And I can just counter the proximal area. Once I reach the other side, double click again. Guess what? Now I have this ghost image on the adjacent tooth. If by any chance you have the adjacent tooth highlighted and the private tooth ghosted, don't worry, just double left <coughs> click on your prep. That's it. Why do you need to train the adjacent teeth? Remember, now you're the lab person. You're doing exactly the same lab work. Because later on, I need to adjust the proximal contact. I need to check the proximal contact. So we need to remove the adjacent tooth. So just for practice, let's also remove the distal adjacent tooth. Double click. There we go. I have my die now. Do you see here on the left side, next? I'm going to click on next here. Guess what? My software now is asking me, enter preparation margin. And you also see automatic margin finder. What you're going to do here, you're going to design or draw the margin and show the computer, show the software where is your margin. Remember, this is a super gingival prep, right? It should be super easy to find the margin. The computer can find the margin itself. If you have a sub gingival case, you still have an arrow, it might be hard. So then you have to use the manual margin finder. If you watch the video, the video gives you more details on that. Do you still see my cursor here? Double left click. I now have a red ball. Automatic margin finder is already running. Do you see a green line there? I'm not doing anything, just one finger here, my trackpad. Okay? <coughs> not doing anything. Not doing anything. Once you do one left click, now the blue line, the blue line is already saved. So we can keep going to the other side of the tube. Still just one finger working here. Because the margin super gingival is well defined, the computer can find out where is the margin. Are we done? Well, Dr. Perdo, I don't think the margin is correct. Sometimes the computer is stupid. Sorry for that What you can do, you can fix the margin. Before hitting next, I'm going to double click here. And guess what? As a dentist, I can tell this stupid machine where it is my margin. Once you hit the next spot there, double click again, voila. <coughs> Clinically speaking, this is the step now. I like to go back to my patient's mouth and double check if my margins are in the correct position. Do you understand now why it's so important to have a decent 90 degrees angle here on the cable surface margin? Because otherwise the computer won't find it what is the margin. It's going to be even harder for you to find where exactly that particular margin. So you're not supposed to be guessing where is the margin. Okay? That's why Dr. Porto mentioned about the finishing diamond points, that you have to recreate the 90 degrees. You have a line <coughs> angle there. Everything is nice and smooth. However, the external cable surface margin is closer to 90 degrees. It's almost like a sharp angle. Right here. Is that clear? I don't like that margin either. Let me fix that. Yeah, looks pretty good. I think you're ready to go. I think you can make even more smooth margin right here. Like that? What do you think? What about over here? Better now? Right here? Yeah, this is probably an impression problem, a 3D impression problem, but let's try to fix that. Why not? 
I don't know. Are you guys happy? So play with the margin finder. Okay, I want you, if you want to go back, just hit here, undo, and you can do the whole thing again. Do it over and over again. If you're happy with your margin, you look at the efficient small, then yeah, it looks okay. I think the margin is right there. You're gonna hit next. The next step here on this software is to define the insertion axis or the insertion path. Why this is so important? Because if you have any undercuts there, guess what? The machine will tell you. So let's be just rotating this prep a little bit here. Do you see some yellow spots there? It's kind of like a warning for the software. Like, hey, wake up. You have some undercuts. So the software is asking to rotate the prep in the 3D here in a way that you don't have any yellow spots. At the same time, the software is asking to rotate the spread in a way that it can still see the proximal clearance. Do you have undercuts there? Can I see the clearance? Green light, you're good to go. Next step is, yep. if you see yellow, do you have to re -prep? That's a good question. Uh, if you see yellow, even if you rotate it into the yellow is still there, let's say my yellow is right here between the axle wall and the gingival floor, absolutely. The software is saying, like, that is something wrong in your prep. I'm just giving a warning, but if you want to keep going, it's up to you. <laughs> Go back to the patient's mouth, re prep that particular spot, that particular area using a finishing diamond, and then you scan the prep again, making sure you, don't, you no longer have the undercut. Yep. So when you were rotating the image on the computer, there were snail spots, but they went away because of the fact that you rotated it? Uh, keep in mind that sometimes the way you take the 3D image, because let's say this is my motor, this is my bicuspid, right? Let's now change the clinical situation. And now this is my motor, and this is my bicuspid. Okay, so my motor is tilted. So because you took the 3D images in one direction, when you, go, when you come to this step here, you might have undercuts right here, meaning you have to rotate this 3D model to explain to the software where is exactly the insertion axis. The prep itself, you don't have undercuts, okay. but the natural position of the tooth might have undercuts. So if you, but you get to the position of the insertion that you want, and then you still see undercuts, that's what you're Right, right. Meaning, internally, you still have undercuts inside your prep. Okay. All right. More questions so far? You still happy? Are you following me? I have a question. Yeah. So if you want convergence for your axial wall, why wouldn't we see an undercut right now? Well, axial walls, they are convergent to the occlusal. Right. They're not divergent. Right. So putting convergence there, you no longer have an undercut here. I, 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 to the center. So this is, look, look at me here. Is that clear? Yeah. So you guys are clear with the convergency and divergency. Axial walls, this is the only exception you have for convergence. Okay? Now, if you're happy with the margin, yep. Um, for the crystal divergent box, is it, there was a number on the PowerPoint that said 10 to 15. Is it supposed to be, is the crystal divergent supposed to be 10 to 15 or is it uh, Let me ask you something. <coughs> Clinically speaking, is that a way to measure that 6 to 8 or 10 degrees? No, but I just. It's purely visual. That's why intentionally I ended up putting 10 degrees there, because honestly, there's no way you can measure it. Now, the diamond point itself will give you some, some sort of divergency, it will give you some relation. And as Dr. Porto mentioned, the diamond point is parallel to the long axis of the tooth. Immediately, you're supposed to have 6 to 8 degrees. But there is no way to measure that, even use the separate software. As long as you can take an occlusal view, you can see all the internal angles, you're good. You're absolutely good. The only thing is, I noticed actually last lab, some students are doing way too much divergence. You don't need that. Doing that, you're actually compromising the cusps. 
Remember resistance form. You're shading down too much, denting enamel, you're compromising the cusps. Don't do that. I will not be happy. Instead of doing an inlay, you might have to do an onlay. If you hit next, pay attention here what's going to happen. The software now is trying to fit in that particular spot more than 400 different crystallations. Also, the software is getting information for the adjacent teeth in terms of the occlusal anatomy here, central fossa. The software is also calculating distance we have from the adjacent mesial tooth, in this case here, and in a complete you know, uh, case, a uh, uh, complex case. The software is also getting information for the adjacent, for the opposing to you. You see how complex it is? For you, <coughs> just a matter of seconds, having an only solution done. That's why this technology is so amazing, because it's doing all the lab work for you. And guess what? As a clinician, if you're doing CAD CAM, automatically you are also the lab person. You are also charging <coughs> the lab fees. More money for you. <laughs> Is that clear? I was in my own lab. Dr. Roberto Dentist had the Dr. Roberto's lab. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. If you're going to Canada, by the way, you can make, even make more money because you're taking more money from the from the tax. Those are also the lab person. <laughs> Any Canadians here? Yeah, I have some Canadians, right? Yeah. I can't get dollar. <laughs> What do you think about anatomy in this restoration here? Do you like that? Yeah, I think so. I think we can do way better than that. And that's exactly the exercise I want you to play with. Okay, I just gave you the basic steps. Now, the goal is 